Uh, good evening, colleagues. Today we have a presentation of the Belarusian Yearbook 2021. Please rename yourself in the Zoom if you haven't done so. I would like to remind you that we have a simultaneous interpretation available. If you are, it's easier for you to listen to us in English, please select the appropriate option. Today we have uh, Marina Rachli. Hello, Marina. I don't know if she can hear me. Yes, I can hear you very well. Anatoly Pankovsky, editor of the Belarusian yearbook and the, the Nasha Mnenia expert community. Hello, Anatoly. Uh, Piotr Rutkowski, director, director of the Belarusian Institute for Strategic Studies. Hello, Piotr. Uh, Gennady Korshunov, ex-director of the Institute of Sociology of the National Academy of Sciences of Belarus, Syria, analyst at the Center for New Ideas. Natalia Aryabova, director of SIMPA slash BIPART. And uh, Dmitry Kruk, economist and senior researcher at the Baroque. Good evening, Dmitry. Good evening. Now I'd like to give floor to the main moderator of today's discussion, Vadim Majeka, please. Hello, Anton. Thank you. It looks like uh, Vadim has a difficulty accessing online Zoom. So uh, I think we'll start with uh, Marina Rachli, who doesn't have much time, as far as I know. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, for the opportunity to start today's session dedicated to the new yearbook of Belarus, basically the new edition of 2021, is the textbook of the modern history of Belarus. Last year became the turning point for Belarus and for Belarusians, it changed a lot. We see that significant part of the society sees itself and its neighbors, its people and its country in a different light. At the beginning of 2020, it was uh, the pandemic. E then it was the electoral campaign that showed that each of them can and must make a contribution into where the country is going and take part in the public life. The, the peaceful protest, according to various accounts, involved uh, about uh, 750,000 people. It's a record number for Belarus, and it shows a turn not only in the mindset, but also in the readiness to act. At the same time, the Belarus regime basically uh, squeezed itself to the repressive functions, and for the last half a year has been busy destroying, uh, eliminating everyone who they it believes to be the opposition. And uh, the psychological trauma described by in the yearbook, the people that were lost due to the pandemic, people, the people that had to leave the eliminated organizations and uh, the brutal force. On the one hand, this is a public trauma. On the other hand, this is a, a loss of trust towards the society, towards the government. Basically, it means that the crisis that we see now, it will be will be very difficult for the authorities to overcome. The regime is uh, uh, holding on by the repression alone. It's not only the Belarusians who see themselves in a different light, and the same is true about the world around us. It's not uh, all about the number of uh, uh, news articles published in the in the main media outlets around the world. 
about the Ryanair flight hijacking or the torture or the situation at the Belarusian and Polish border. It's also the fact that Belarus is seen by the Western uh, countries as the subject, as an actual politics, not an object. Not only Belarus changed, but also the year book, the yearly book did. In 2019, uh, judging by the National Media website, it was published with the official book flag um, of um, red and green color, which is impossible to imagine now. Currently, it's not only the color gamut has changed, but also the team has changed. Not all of the team members are in Belarus. Not all of them are uh, walking free. I think colleagues will also mention that. With all the changes in mind, we need to note that the, the important thing, the most important thing remains. It's the high quality of the analytical materials is the wide range of topics covered. The only thing I lacked was uh, the new public role or the new image of of the women's participation in the politics and their role. Because last year in the West, in the Western press and their analytical materials, this was one of the major topics, the new Belarusian feminism and the yearly book of 2020. One doesn't have a separate article dedicated to it. However, there is a range of best experts in the field and uh, from different countries. Here I would stop and wish all of us today an interesting discussion and interesting presentation and wish the yearbook of a lot of public interest and a lot of reviews. Thank you very much, Marina. I'm sorry once again for the technical glitches. I have uh, bad internet access today. Thank you very much for this review. Uh, the actor, the authors of the yearbook that are currently jailed are women, Valeria Kostigova, Olga Loika. Undoubtedly, I would say that the women's the team uh, of the yearbook is currently under pressure. It affects the possibility to present their voices, but we'll do everything possible for the yearbook to live on and for Valeria Kostigova's case to be covered. And also, thank you very much for your support. So Solidarity is important. It, it is something that allows us to keep on and work even in the hardest of time. Thank you, Marina. And, uh, to discuss the content of the yearbook and to talk about the foreign policy, I would like to give floor to the editor of the book, Anatoly Pinikovsky. Right, so I get message that uh, I have unstable internet connection, so I'm sorry for my uh, equipment. Finally, we have prepared the yearbook dedicated to the trends of the 2020. The yearbook is published later and it has not been fully published yet because as you know the website was closed in october it's currently being transferred it's already available at the http without s at the end so it's not a particularly safe connection we have uh, dmitry who is dealing with that i think in the ne next several days the HTML, traditionally, pub and PDF 
the website will be available also at the partners website at least uh, those partners who uh, will have enough courage to publish it this yearbook this year is uh, uh, has red and white colors in it that's what, as far as the technical aspects are about as far as i'm concerned i want to remind you that traditionally the, the yearbook is uh, a presentation very often it was the presentation was held in the summer in more favorable conditions weather conditions as well we uh, prepared it in a special room this is the first time we use this format of the presentation i have here chardonnay as you probably guessed uh, from 2020 so when we finish this session i will celebrate it alone as i said luckily i uh, had help in writing the introduction with all the basic trends spelled out over there in the all of the spheres my uh, presentation will be on behalf of the foreign policy block it has several articles about russia poland ukraine united states and uh, th third world countries or political political in a politically correct way it's called the traditional countries once uh, somebody actively was arguing how how much they for the domestic policy defines the foreign policy and the other around how the foreign policy defines the parameters of the domestic policy i would like to say that the end, beginning of the year did not have any signs of the ideal or the perfect storm the foreign perfect storm that uh, the the whole thing ended with and uh, the form it all ended with the political default as i think well, it was said by kazakevich and the first the, there's in uh, american relations are the american swing because uh, in the first part of the year the positive trends were making stronger we were getting stronger and similar trends have been uh, happening over the last several years uh, the political and economic operation reached the new heights it's enough remembering that uh, the oil conflict with russia which started at the beginning of the year ended up with uh, um, mike pompeo promise to cover all the needs of belarus for oil at the competitive price and uh, as a result as the analyst notes the budget relations were in the best uh, at the best level they have be, had been for the last several years however after the august 2020 after the presidential elections the second part of the year all the achievements uh, were actually um, cancelled and the Belgian and American relations hit the rock bottom. The same, the same is true about the relation between the Belarus and the European Union. At the beginning of the year, uh, their admission and the visa, visa agreements were discussed and the, but the presidential campaign um basically cancelled the normalization process that 
it lasted several years. The sanctions were in, introduced and the parties went back to the rhetoric they used to make use of in the last several years. The COVID pandemic also negatively influenced the presidential relationship. So the relationship that I mentioned did not lead to the those in diplomacy get more active towards the developing countries. And we can only mention that somehow Minsk managed to rely on the political support of Beijing, which uh, so far hasn't led to any material or tangible results. And finally, Russia. It's important to know that the, the major tasks set by Putin and Lukashenko last year was supposed to lead to the uh, closer relationship and uh, economic arguments uh, as of spring 2020 involved uh, some arguments about the restructuring of debts for the uh, atomic power stations. So uh, one of the presidents was supposed to hold a constitutional referendum about uh, prolonging certain uh, powers, and uh, those presidents were supposed to get re-elected, but it turned out differently. Going back to economic arguments that I mentioned earlier, the anti-epidemic policy was added uh, while Russia followed the WHO recommendations and introduced some quarantine measures. Belarus decided to act like a COVID dissident and COVID outcast, which was actively criticizing the world uh, for the COVID measures. So uh, the, Russia's role in the electoral campaign was seen as the negative, uh, the of power that was encroaching on the Belarusian sovereignty. We can remember the, the Belagropa Bank case, the Wagner, group case, but it's clear that the Minsk thought that the policy of of uh, this adversarial attitude towards Russia will be highly valued in the West, but it turned out that the flag was uh, pointing to the anti-Western mood and not the anti-Russian. Even though the Kremlin acknowledged the victory, recognized the victory of the Belarusian president almost instantly and uh, uh, stepped away from the policy of non-involvement, and uh, helped the Belarusian regime, even though it was not particularly quick to do that. At the end of August, Putin uh, made uh, important statements that uh, there was a, a special unit of soldiers in reserve ready to help Lukashenko if needed. Moreover, after The Kremlin sent a political technologist to Belarus, expert in uh, mass media, mass media expert, and uh, I believe that even though this this didn't this is not uh, supposed to be a, 
um, much of a help, but it was quite decisive in its character. When confrontation could have led to different results that we see today, uh, the material assistance. I also mentioned the 1.5 billion of the dollars of the loan that Putin promised to provide uh, to Lukashenko in September. It's not that much. Uh, it's not as much as it used to be, but uh, it's still some help. Still, Kremlin uh, supports, continually supports the constitutional reform and the national dialogue. The main uh, idea uh, of the Kremlin's attitude to Belarus is the it insists on the same thing as the EU countries are insisted on, the stability. But at the same time, it uh, doesn't agree with the EU policy. And the national dialogue that the Kremlin supports is supposed to happen with uh, and to control the Russian political elites. The general line and my uh, presentation would look the following way. Last year, the collapse of the post-Soviet imperial com complex received an additional stimulus and the political crisis in Belarus is part of this process. Last year, for example, Armenia was again involved in the confrontation with Azerbaijan. There was uh, another political crisis that uh, engulfed Kyrgyzstan in Khabarovsk in Russia, the protests were raging. And at the beginning of this year, there were protests in support of Alexei Navalny in Russia. And only one of the five participants of the Eurasian economic community in Kazakhstan is in some relative balance. If we don't touch upon the political process in Russia, in all the cases, the Russia always reacted without a particular uh, uh, particular uh, energy uh, uh, towards the conflicts in the post-Soviet states, and it didn't really want to support much the countries that the support of Lukashenko during the crisis situation did not exceed the volume of support of Russian support in the previous relatively quiet years. Thank you for your attention. I give floor to uh, back to you, Vadim. Thank you, Anatoly, for this multi-dimensional overview. We shouldn't forget that uh, we are not left alone uh, with our problems, and uh, they need to be treated in its context. And uh, the Kazakhstan, uh, as you said, uh, in a relatively quiet balance where the transit of power is in full blast. Before I give floor to our next speaker, I would like to note that uh, the text of the Bills in the Yearbook is not available to the public yet for technical reasons. And the newsletter that Anatoly mentioned in the internal one, the authors have the text and we will make the newsletter a bigger one and very soon we'll publish it at the national media website also it will be available with a new name called the mmn media that will be the new name of the website thank you We'll publish it at the old and the new website, at the BISS website, and uh, we'll be happy to spread it as much as possible. Indeed, uh, I'll give the floor to 
Петр Рудковский, it's important to touch upon the topic of uh, last year's election, because whatever topics we touch upon today, any discussions of the 2020 will be uh, discussed in the context of the repression, torture, and uh, the elections. In order to sort it out, I give floor to Piotr Rutkowski, who is the director of the Russian Institute for Strategic Studies, who wrote about, about this thing exactly in the yearbook. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the my background. We're in the hotel on the way to the airport, and uh, hopefully you may he hear me well. Firstly, I would like to share with you my feeling, a ambivalent feeling, about the joy that finally this year's yearbook, which is very important, uh, is uh, available. And I'm glad that the quality is quite high in the sense that it's comprehensive. At the same time, the fact that uh, Ms. Agostigova and Loika are in prison is very discouraging. This yearbook and the possibility to write an article for it, make it made it possible both then and now, when we're discussing this, to look at the situation uh, in the prospects of the 2.5 years. A lot has been said about the migration crisis, institutional reform underway, but I think it's a good uh, opportunity to analyze what was happening long before the election. That's what I wanted to focus on. Several points here. First, uh, the uh, public has uh, a de demand for the new con contract, social contract. And uh, I'm talking here about the possi possible constitutional reform. It, it did appear in the past, starting from 2019. Second point, the regime launched the campaign on uh, humanizing uh, law enforcement bodies and trying to somehow mitigate one of one of the factors that uh, were frowned upon by the people. It's one of the campaigns, one of the decisions uh, in 2019 was the replacement of Mr. Shunech by Mr. Karayev, whose major mission was to um, improve the image of the police. He took upon this, upon, took upon that upon himself, and uh, six months later, the situation changed, and now we don't even remember uh, that relatively long, short time ago, the regime was trying to make the police look more human. Totally, looks totally different now. As uh, the presidential election were nearing, the regime was playing the, the independence and sovereignty card at the same time time the sovereignty was uh, above all defended against uh, the threat coming from the east not from the west so inside the country there was hope that the the public was getting together around the idea of sovereignty however the regime was trying to continue improving relationship with the West. Again, 
um, moving closer to the elections of 2020. There was a number of tactical steps. Uh, first is the postponement of the presidential address to the people and to the parliament. Traditionally, uh, it was uh, held in May or in April. It was postponed until the first day of the election. So the presidential campaign affected it. It uh, shows that uh, long before uh, the activities of uh, August 2020, the regime understood that the public was demanding change. This is a very important point, which we need to consider in the context of the, the scenario of the future actions. The attempts to un understand or guess what would be the next steps of the, re of the regime, including the referendum. Still, the regime doesn't really want to change and regime wants to avoid um, the image of being under pressure anyone of anyone else in Russia, the opposition or the West. But considering the fact that it was uh, already happening before the election, that some changes must happen, it means that the the changes will happen in this or that, that way. A referendum is not just about imitation. It's an attempt of the regime of the authorities to conduct the changes that were discussed a long time ago and raised a long time ago without a particular pressing pressure of the people of the public and mostly the, the pressure was coming from inside the regime of course the Belarusian system of authority is uh, highly personal, personalized but here the main person is very much dependent on its environment people surrounding him that was a uh, it from me a short uh, overview of the 2.5 years before the elections and the trends that took place inside the regime. I think we can um, claim that uh, the changes will happen this or that way and they will uh, bear some risks for the regime as well. After the 27 years, the auto reform can have a side effect. Thank you. Thank you, Piotr, for uh, for this. Indeed, we remember the steps to improve the image of the police. I remember uh, Nasha Niva published an article where it was co comparing the reform of the local policemen saying that the Belarusian local policemen will be like those of the in the United States. Uh, of course, now it's impossible to imagine such an article in the National Eva. Now there are, everything has changed. Indeed, the, cha the time times are changing, the authorities are changing, the approaches are changing, the public is changing, the civil society is changing. We've seen the transformation happening inside the society in the last two years. Of course, the, the state of the civil society organizations has changed. The civil society is more institutionalized now. And the expert community has changed to talk more about this in detail. I would like to give floor to Natalia Aryabova, who is the director of SIMPA slash BIPART. Uh, could you tell us what you think about what has been happening in the last several years and the changes that followed? Thank you very much.
I will tell you about the, some aspects of the civil society. Vadim uh, recently wrote an article about that, uh, and we made a research about this. I'll tell you about the courtyard communities that we researched. It's an interesting group of people. I'll tell you also a few words about our sector. Talking about the civil society in general, we can see the following trends. In 2020, there was a criminalization of the civic activity. What had been uh, innocent gradually became a crime. Then from the money collection for something uh, to um, people meeting for tea, drink and parties. In 2020, we thought there was uh, nowhere else to fall, but in the 2021 showed that we could go deeper. And the yearbook depicts the fall of the civil society organizations and how its members took it. Uh, the 2021 showed the big involvement of people, the volunteers, political activists, and some people, uh, ordinary people, taking part in everything. It was the heyday of the current funding campaigns, uh, the uh, aid campaign for medics and other activities was actively financed. Gradually, we saw the communication channels for the state being destroyed from the both parties, both sides. The desire to communicate was weakening. weakening. Uh, oh. There were a number of reasons for that. While some organizations continued to cooperate after this summer of 2020, after they were closed down in 2021, they stopped doing this. In 2020, we saw the increased pressure on the society in general, and there were a number of measures used against the civil society. And Vadim, his article said that we're probably in for the Russian type lore about the foreign agents widely discussed in the past, but I uh, indeed remember us discussing this, but uh, the third is decided to use the more brutal scenario of closing down everyone. The, the appearance of the industrial trade union and the unions of uh, cultural workers, teachers and doctors. At the end of this article, Vadim wrote the communication platform uh, was uh, supposed to imp improve, but it didn't happen. In the spring of 2021, when it was written this article, there was a hope that uh, that it could have been reinstated uh, by peaceful means. Nobody believes in that anymore. As to the courtyard communities, the Simpa Baripad research uh, spoke with a number of people who are members of such communities. Over 3,000 people gave us feedback through uh, forms. Many of them said that they want to belong to a community, but we thought that if the person one year after did not, did not did not join any any community that probably means that they don't really want to there were some periods in august september 2020 there was a growth the local communities were grown out of the local chats and there were 
getting together for tea drink and I'm thinking what to do next. We thought that there'll, there'll be a big future following it. Uh, then inertia overcame this um, uh, Sunday. Protest actions became routine and the agendas shifted towards the local governance. Certain local groups creation of, uh, of communication channels. In January, March 2021, the number of people supporting protests has gone down due to the repression and disappointment. And people are thinking of the safe forms to support change and to promote change. There, are not, there were not many of those left. And starting from April until recently, there's, we have been witnessing the survival uh, of the communities with the desire to keep the main members of the organizations and to hold some underground meetings. As to the research center sector, here are the following trends. Of course, it is uh, the research centers uh, noted that the COVID-19 pandemic affected negatively the society. There was a special website covering this topic, particularly considering the fact that the official uh, stance of the government was negative and uh, sociological polls were very much in demand um, recently because analysts wanted to understand what was happening. We are seeing more and more forecasts about uh, this ending at some point in the future. We saw some cooperation in 2020, research centers got together to create an association that could be inspired from inside in the beginning of 2021, and a board like that was created. There were a lot of research conducted in 2020. In 2020, there were fewer events due to this, the crisis. Those that were conducted were held online, were not particularly popular. There were less communication, was less communication uh, with the state authorities, both formal and informal. I guess Gennady Koshno will speak more about the relationship between the society and the, and the state. So that's it for me in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Gennady will be the next to speak. Just wanted to clarify several things. Since you mentioned my article, the foreign agents and the discussion was under forecast. I think I knew where it was going, but I didn't think it was going so fast. Just like with the bank payments, we missed the checkbooks and moved to the plastic cards. While in Africa, they started directly with the uh, online payments. And the same is true of the builders and authorities who which, which uh, uh, missed several stages and decided to close down everyone. Indeed, I'm not, we're not talking about the mass reinstatement of relationship, but when I write about 2021, there are Right, that there are organizations that 
start going back to their activities like they did in 2019, even though they have been liquidated. Let's say the Breast Fortress Rebirth Facebook account shows information that they get together like they did in the older times. Such organizations are now not on the agenda, not covered by the media and not uh, don't want to draw attention to themselves, understanding that it's not the most favorable of times. Maybe we should understand whether such experiences is a one-off or maybe people in regions are doing this on a wider scale. Any normal cooperation that we saw in the past was uh, cut by the 2020 and the systemic crisis of relations between the society and the authorities will hopefully now will be commented on by Inez uh, Korshno. The 2020 enriched uh, our sector with people who left the state sector. Hello and thank you. I tried to understand and analyze what was happening in 2020 through several concepts. You can see that these concepts proved to be successful because independently there have been in demand by many and they're actively used. The first concept was the concept of the social contract. Peter mentioned that and just like Peter, I decided to uh, look back and understand when the social contract was formed in the way we have it now and how it was gradually destroyed. And it, I believed, uh, I saw that there was a social contract of 1994 when uh, the authorities were basically proposed to support the society for society promising not to take part in any political activity. It's a simplified uh, description. Of course, it was much more difficult than this, but this helps us to understand the stages of this contract, of its development and its devaluation. Uh, in 1994, together with the elections of the first president of the Belarus, this social contract was concluded. It actively developed the first 10 or 12 years when it was possible to use uh, the inertia of the Soviet industrialization on the one hand. And on the one hand, there were available cheap Russian support and Russian resources. And the Russian support was unconditional. In the middle of 2000s, unconditionality of the first and second options be become rare and the division government stops delivering on the social contract. It had concluded the in the middle of the 2000s, the authorities start to switch people into the self-serving regime when the, the pension is recalculated, some groups of people are excluded from the, the lists of people subject that uh, uh, discounts and deductions. So uh, basically this society and the tortoises are moving away from each other uh, doing their thing. The main idea was to not to interfere with the uh, existence of 
the opponent party. And this reality could exist for a, a long time and then ind independently, but the crisis destroyed the parity. The crisis is comprehensive, but first and foremost is, was the crisis of the first COVID wave when the authorities, according to the society, uh, decided not to fulfill its functions. The first function was to su uh, support some social standards. The authorities were spending less and less on the social sector. And during the COVID times, the society thought that the authorities decided to deliver on their uh, agreements. The Belarusian society was, when uh, the authorities showed that was uh, not dependable, when the desacralization happened during the first COVID wave, the society started to started to solve the problems itself it was self-organized getting self-organized becoming an actor as an actor who can take decisions and uh, make them practical implement them and uh, bear responsibility for them without a doubt the first stage of this process uh, and the disclaimer here is that the zero stage was huge when the, for the 10 to 15 years the society was improving their competences the digital communicative and so on but it all came to the fore during the first wave of COVID in the frame of the this existential challenge there was a threat uh, for the life of each and every person and for the society in general. Each individual was threatened, if not directly, then indirectly by the nearest and dearest. Next stage is the beginning of the electoral campaign. It was when the society, when it felt that it was becoming an actor during the COVID times, The society felt it was powerful, powerful enough right after the first wave of COVID, when the people had had a feeling of victory, being victorious. The sociological polls shows that the society felt that they have defeated COVID that it was not the authorities, but the society. And the society decided to and wanted to prolong the victory uh, and cover the political space. I suspect uh, these intentions were felt by many of those who became the candidates who run, ran for the elections. And particularly Babarika, since, since his son was managing the digital platforms where this self-organizing mechanics was evident. I think it was an important factor still. The second stage was when uh, was the electoral in nature when people decided that to embody the nature of being an actor that they felt during uh, the COVID wave. And here the most important result was that the people not only felt that they were powerful, people saw the scale of uh, the society. The main result of the second electoral stage was the destruction of the myth that the majority support Lukashenko. 
the new myth appeared, the new meme appeared, uh, Sasha, 3%. The majority understands that uh, it's not 3% of support that Lukashenko has, but it's not just desacralization. It's uh, basically the beginning of the delegitimation. And the third stage is the post-electoral one. which started on the day of the elections. It is, again, the existential thing, an existential challenge when this feeling of us, the global, that begin to appear and was founded on the positive wave during the electoral stage, it received the uh, embodiment of pain when Thanks to this instant horizontal nature of the network of the internet, almost everything happening in the society, in Akrist, in a prison, in Maladeshina, everywhere became available. The information about it became available to others, to all people. Uh, at the time, it was still not clear how big is the gap there was and how quickly it was growing the gap between the society and the authorities between the uh, different ethical system between the different self perception self-awareness and uh, what people were ready to do and how they see the the reality how they see belarus and the last point here i believe we should start thinking about the horizontal revolution that uh, is the result of these three stages when there's a big, great feeling of us uniting people. I would uh, love to say that it unites all Belarusians, but not everyone, but still it's a big number of Belarusians. And uh, most importantly, not uh, only those living inside Belarus, but uh, those who are temporarily, I hope, are living outside Belarus. It's a, a huge and uh, actor, horizontal, means that hierarchy doesn't work. It becomes secondary to the distributed activity of the actors. And when the speed of the appearance, the new behavioral and vo value models when the speed is very high and it's very the multiplication happens instantly i mean that of the effective practices thanks to which at the second half of the 2020 the protest part of the society the digital avant-garde if you if i may actively influence the situation the agenda uh, being ahead of the authorities almost in all success apart from the uh, the law enforcement sector in conclusion i wrote that it's very difficult to forecast any uh, directions where things may go because despite the higher uh, the hot nature of the repression, the according to multitude of research in June, uh, July, August, uh, the protest potential was at the same level like it was at the end of 2020, at the beginning of the 2021. Also, it's very hard to forecast anything considering the big number of the actors here. It's not only this distributed actor of the Belarusian society, it's not only the the reduced actor in the face of the Belarusian authorities, but also they are international actors, plus the uncontrolled factor of COVID pandemic, which plays its role. We see the wave, the new wave coming, although the authorities are saying that the wave is subsided, but uh, uh, it, it's probably not the last one. Also, it turned out that the 
additional huge cumulative factor here were the black swans that were impossible to forecast starting from the Ryanair and ending now with the, the migrant crisis inspired and inspired by the authorities. I believe the trends that I described in that destroy the social contract. It's impossible to go back to the social contract that it used to be. Indeed, something new is needed. And the big question whether the authorities will be able to offer anything apart from the internal occupation uh, approach that is currently implemented. And uh, the big question whether the authorities will be, the people will be accept what the authorities are proposing. And next, uh, the protest potential, this the desire and tension towards changes demonstrated by the Belarusian society and the increase of the horizontal practices is obvious. The big question is whether the authorities be able to destroy it because currently we see the uh, huge machine destroying uh, the this mood every day with the growing number of political prisoners and the growing number of people arrested. But the potential is still there. The practices, the horizontal practices are work. And uh, we want to believe that the society still acts like an actor and horizontal practices and revolution that started last year uh, would not die out. I think it will not die out. It's like uh, learning how to ride a bicycle. It remains with you for good. Thank you very much. Thank you for this optimistic conclusion. When we talk about the crisis of Russia between the authorities and the people, it's hard to be optimistic. I would like now to ask Dmitry, Dmitry Kochley, a political scientist, to join our discussion because we'd like to talk about the local authorities, the parties, the social and political foundation. Dmitry Kochley, are you with us? Good evening. I'm sorry, I forgot my cam, so I cannot turn it on. That's okay. Um, anything that's live, okay. he may just put a background like a sea, image of the sea or something. When we hear about the political parties, indeed, we really need to uh, sedate an image. Right, if you can, please show us something so that uh, we'll have something more interesting than a black screen on the, in the recording. Dmitry, do you think you can do that? We mean me sharing the screen. If you can uh, put an image, then it's fine. If not, it would be interesting to learn about the political parties and the local authorities. The parties uh, have their roles changed. And uh, some uh, 
Dobrik proponents are still working on the Vmesti or together party. Right, let's see, look at the cover of the Belarusian yearbook. Right, okay. I'll start with the local authorities. <laughs> most important thing here, the most important trends here, I'll mention them and tell you how and why they were developing. In 2020, the local authorities received more of an economic and uh, epidemiological freedom in the decision-making. We remember the reaction of Alexander Lukashenko, but the local authorities uh, were, I believe, more responsible. Because the national authorities allowed them to make their own decisions in their rayons uh, regarding the lockdown measures. Piotr, he mentioned the, the desire to change is spreading but it is spreading uh, on the, the local governance authorities because when the dialogue platforms appeared at the end of the 2020 some representatives of the authorities or officials Uh, this express some progressive ideas and for example in Grodna the chairman <coughs> chairman of the council I believe his name was uh, proposed the idea of mayor election which uh, looks like a positive idea. Still, despite all the these expectations, I mean, the local authorities, during the political crisis, they, uh, they expressed their loyalty to Alexander Lukashenko. And the authorities came out to the protesters trying to change their mind, giving them hope for negotiations. Then there was launched uh, this platform, the dialogue platform. As I mentioned earlier, indeed, there were some good ideas expressed. Some of the people didn't express them, uh, while I believe that it's all originated uh, in Grodno. This reform agenda has to do with uh, international programs, which were initiated by the EU, and they did form this. Uh, approach. So now when the EU has stopped these programs, the officials uh, will not get the, this knowledge, money, right, also This is feedback, increased feedback with the population, with the people, and the communication, increased communication forced the uh, local officials make decisions that were not in line with those of Alexander Lukashenko, because we all knew what his uh, position. 
as to the economic decentralization according to the decree uh, economic support local authority could change the payment periods and or to decrease some the sums of the 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 tax rates what ex what they did which they did which was beneficial for the entrepreneurs because it was aimed at them and the business circles in general also i believe that uh, the locals the local officials representatives of the local councils will push people to the reforms and to changes that is one of the factors why there will be a referendum also if uh, all these proposals have been considered then uh, the authorities have been alone worried about uh, the fact that the, there are too many deputies or MPs elected in the rural areas and uh, there were a lot of proposals to cancel this primary level I mean the rural councils the reform has been ongoing for a long time and the grandma the number has been going down but they want to remove this level to cancel this eliminate it and uh, moreover they want to replace it with the uh, administration that is gets appointed with the uh, elections of the head of the administration but the conservative nature conservative approach to alexander lukashenko may uh, interfere with that although it has been discussed for a long time maybe you could comment on the political parties I will add that the, these uh, powers will grow, will spread in a different way. Different areas react uh, to it in a different way. Not like Alexander Lukashenko does. A few words about the political parties. Party organizations or parties start building uh, around the new popular leaders. Also, the old ones don't no longer want to work with the so-called old parties both registered and non-registered uh, created in the past this of course increases competition of the party opposition with the uh, with the new initiatives the party opposition the right wing ones central and right wing ones they uh, get involved in the new initiatives uh, it's evident in the headquarters of Sikhanovsk and the coordinate council at the same time other parties uh, which is interesting some pro-government parties did sign the manifest 
with the agenda of for civil society for the civil society and uh, but in the second half of the 2020 when the we saw the harsh repressions unravel they had to decrease their activity although before the election democratic organizations worked well did, made a great did a great job involving a lot of people both the new initiatives and the ones created earlier the parties created earlier also when Viktor Babarika was started to run for the election he had 14,000 people signing up for his group but after the election after the rep repression hit and they were getting pace the headquarters of Babarika had 2.7 people this is a big number of people considering the fact that other parties other initiatives could not have uh, so many mm, participants on the, on the list and the first quarter was quite successful for primaries where several parties took place initially there was an idea to make the coalition as wide as possible but no parties joined it just five parties did this project ended with a failure and it was the third election when the opposition forces declared to, that they would elect uh, or select joint candidates but they fail and the only successful form of cooperation form is the party observation but in 2020 it was a success in the sense that the parties had a lot of experience doing this but in 2020 are lagging behind the new initiatives in terms of involving volunteers like Zubar, honest people, and the and the like, and probably all in, in during the future elections there will be more of situational coalitions or ad hoc co coalitions. But for now, we cannot forecast. Currently, we cannot forecast how much the decision to liquidate or re-register these parties be taken because they unlike public organizations are not interfered with by the authorities only after they signed this manifesto with uh, their demands 
the the inspection started, but so far none of the parties have been liquidated. Pro looks like the existence of a big number of parties is uh, beneficial and the absence of one or two of them which would uh, unite all the volunteers and the authorities will probably leave this number of parties to stay. The parties that uh, have been registered in Belarus or not registered, will probably not be able to broadcast the rhetoric that uh, was broadcast by the ex external leaders living abroad, like uh, national management body or the Tikhanovska headquarters. Most probably, while the parties had the single agenda. Parties or democratic forces. It looked like some leaders started acting independently with their own agenda. And the tensions will probably rise. Tensions between various bodies with time will increase because the they get they get tired and the fighting for human resources and uh, this agenda the joint agenda will be put into question i think that's it from me thank you dmitry you may stop the screen sharing and I, I think before we give floor to Dmitry Kruk who has a presentation to tell us about macroeconomic situation and the prospect I uh, would like to go back to what Dmitry said about primaries because the active activity of uh, political summer, they eclipsed the spring, uh, therefore there was no time to comment on it. I think it's beside the fact that the primaries ended due to the coronavirus, there was an internal conflict. It was that the Palestinians, his proponents, they said that Yuri Hubarevich, the, blamed him for uh, some uh, bad competition. But whether it whether it will political opposition. Uh, could destroy the get of their proponents was a big qu question or should they get focused on themselves so apart from primaries ended in nothing going nowhere we saw that the people uh, like order Kovalkova was an outsider but it was a uh, actually working with Svetlana Tikhanovska, a member of the Coordinating Council, uh, and Yuri Gabarich is also representative of uh, management, national management body. So these people are actively involved in political processes. Again, it's hard to say 
understanding that many people are jailed and we want all the political prisoners to uh, walk free. That's the political situation now. Mr. Kruk is with us. And uh, now, last but not least, let's talk about the macroeconomic situation. And because judging by the economic situation in Belarus and its prospect, we may say that it, uh, it feels in it's in bad condition, but it looks like macroeconomic situation is not that bad as many had expected. Thank you, Vadim. Thank you. Hello, colleagues. I'll be brief on the background of the all the fundamental uh, significant process in the political dimension, the social dimension. In 2020, the economy was an, an extra feature. Many felt that the economy may, economy's role may in, increase, it may the catalyst for social and political process, but it hasn't been happened so far. But in future, the economy will get back to it in, in the spotlight. Let's see why it happened. There were four main events. In the, in the economic the sense, they are more like more so, more or less equal. In 2020, I put them in a chronological order in terms of importance. If we judge by the economic criteria, I think the COVID-19 and aftermath uh, should go first. But in terms of significance, they're more or less equal. A few words about each of them. An oil conflict with Russia uh, seems to have to be too prolonged. And for any other, it would have been an, a very important event. But in 2020, the importance was that uh, if we imagine the a balance, uh, on the one hand, the economy was uh, facing the recession and potentially depression. The oil conflict with uh, Russia, which at the beginning of 2020 became more and more actual and uh, put in the balance of the it uh, contributed to recession before the conf conflict with Russia 2020 it looked like a regular one in line with other grays there was no obvious development but there's no crisis the CPA era of stagnation which started in 2012 uh, 2017 uh, there was a slight growth but without several significant development in November, December 2019, it was supposed to continue, but the oil conflict with Russia changed the track and changed the expectations. So this recession impulse was important. The oil conflict with Russia, from the point of the big Russia, well, big picture was uh, also important. It uh, showed the permanent contradiction and the threat to the major sector of the Belgian economy, the oil processing sector, which in many ways, uh, based on its model, depends on the preferential conditions well, that it had with Russia. So it was a blow not only at the time why Belarus and Fortis were decided to stop the oil shipments because for them it was a systemic blow. Basically, the oil processing industry was put into question. 
and it still isn't the question in question all is just the other actions activities they eclipse this situation then chronologically was the COVID-19 and its aftermath uh, eclipsed the conf conflict with Russia and uh, pushed to the compromise in 2019. And the COVID, you probably remember the atmosphere of April or beginning of May when the mood, uh, the general mood was uh, it, it, it's probably the biggest recession in the world history of the Second World War, and the majority of the countries, the forecast, they uh, proved to be true. This shock uh, didn't, didn't seem to be as long term as uh, people expected at, at the beginning. And what's more important the, in Belarus, we had uh, our own way of dealing with things. I mean, fights in the COVID. Uh, so they decided to put everything on the saving the keeping the production, no lockdown as such. They wanted to avoid even the temporary decrease of the production. And it was a fundamental choice which in many ways um, laid foundation for further events. This bet won because the effect of the COVID was relatively short term. If uh, the situation in May and April lasted until August and September, the consequences would be totally different. The next benchmark event already mentioned here it was a polit political crisis it had two consequences i think everybody remembers that the financial shock and a big demand for foreign currency in august september 2019 together with colleagues at the time i said that belarus was really close to a financial crisis um, very much reproached by this now. I still have arguments and figures to defend my point of view that uh, in September, October, Belarus was walking on the edge of the face of the financial crisis. Uh, Belarus managed to avoid it or nip it in the bud, but uh, with uh, two things. First is that we had a lot of reserves accumulated in the previous years and they were actively used. There was a clear cut decision. And the second, the trend that is relevant today, it's the beginning of trade. And the end of the 2021 showed that was uh, not a temporary increase, it was a midterm trend. It was a big demand for foreign trend for for Belarusian goods, Belarusian export. I'm not gonna go deep in explaining why it's hap it happened, but this phenomenon, while the, the first three or the first three were serious stones thrown towards repression and uh, contribute to repression that uh, the foreign trade miracle together with the uh, un unconventional, unconventional policy helped take economy on a new trajectory which in uh, may and june seemed uh, overly optimistic i will show you the graphs you can see this is the new date uh, from the 2021. Where I'm pointing, this is the end of the 2020. The expectations that the recession, you can see here the GDP level, 
you can compare the recession of the 2020 to that of the 2015, 2016. The initial expectations were that the recession of the 2020 would be much more significant uh, due to COVID and uh, uh, economic shock. Many countries did face this downturn. We walked on the, we had the light scenario of the COVID aftermath at least in 2020. This graph uh, explains why the economy was put in the back burner, did not become an extra catalyst of the political and social situation. Another graph for what, what we call foreign trade miracle. Red is the import figure and the blue is the export figure. You can see the large scale growth here Whoa. was a very fast. Was only experienced in 2011 due to the devaluation of the currency and uh, Belarus reached the historical maximum in terms of the export volumes. These are the consequences of the COVID. You can see the gap between the export and import figures. This foreign trade miracle phenomenon is still one of the key background conditions which formed during the 2020. From the point of view of uh, the bigger picture, if we don't limit ourselves uh, with the conditions of the 2020. The fact that uh, the background and the environment uh, wasn't in the long term, the political, the policy of the authorities is that uh, could be called uh, we need to survive today. Be before they had a different logic. Why did other countries did not follow this path? Because this path leads to or bear, has long-term risks. Economists have been talking about uh, weak growth on the slow growth of the Belarusian economy and uh, how Belarus is lagging behind its neighbors, particularly in the north. This trend has in grown. Before the COVID, before the political crisis, the GDP growth was about 2.5%. At least that's what majority of my colleagues agreed upon. Now it's at least a little bit more than a zero. If we put sanctions on the sidelines, the Belarusian economy cannot generate a substantial growth. It's really small. It's the 2.5% which cannot be achieved now. Another important consequences of 2020, or the period from 2016 to 2019, the, the traditional in 2019, it was a, an attempt to normalize uh, the economic center based on the economic criteria. And the inflation there was low and absence of disproportion that led to the jumps in the currency exchange rate. In the first part of 2015 and then 2016 was declared as uh, targets uh, of the authorities and they, they were there until 2019. In 2015, slash 2019, this period was called the 
economic policy revolution because the economic system was joined by system with good image. In 2020, uh, this was stopped. There were some uh, good things that accumulated in the system, uh, but they were buried. Using diplomatic terms, it was put into question that achievements. The third fundamental consequences and the bridge to the realities is the financial fragile fragility. It was the shifting of the burden and uh, starting from April to July, there was the financial positions of the state enterprises was decreasing, was getting weaker. Uh, the foreign trade uh, miracle still allows to mitigate the, for this. But the question is how long will we, we feel the effects the this foreign trade miracle? I can't say that we're now on the edge of the uh, financial failure, but we're still, the system, financial system is still very frail. So any serious blow, what we have seen in the world, like the uh, abrupt devaluation of the Turkish lira, many financial markets uh, feel this shock. These shocks, both external and internal, can put Belarus into financial crisis or stress turn into crisis very quickly. So the, the situation is very frail and saying that we are far away from the abyss is impossible. We just made several steps away from it, but we're still very close. And uh, next, the de depressive nature of the internal demand here, apart from the economic things, economic behavior now is affected by the political factors. In terms of business, we saw that there's an attempt to not to develop, but to keep the positions. If you want to keep the position, you're not investing, you're not developing a business. So the investment demand is going down and and seen in the 2021, it originated in 2021. Similar in scale uh, is what is happening with the consumer demand, according to national bank figures, the, the number of people has grown who are not confident and um, not sure about the future. So, uh, the normal function of the economic system is in the threat. And the last slide about uh, 2021, the heritage of the 2020 that we feel now. In many ways, I will repeat myself, but the first thing here, it's uh, probably will be true about 2021. The here, we need to understand this uncertainty is a regular feature of, of any forecast. But what we see now is the large scale uncertainty. It's unprecedented for our history and for uh, our relationship with other countries. While in the past, we could argue whether the growth would be two or 3%. Uh, 
but usually the scenario was the same. We knew that uh, the economy will be growing, if not fast, but at some degree, to some degree. But currently, there are different scenarios of what will happen, and the more or less it's the same chance of implementing. Basically, today the chance of the enemy growth from zero to one percent is that the deep non-deep recession with financial crisis can also is also possible these scenarios are equal this big uncertainty sensitivity to a big number of unknown factors is the heritage of 2020 which uh, crawled into 2021 and 2022 the next uh, is the permanent financial frailty or fragility again it dates back to the 2020 and the next thing is the growing inflation trend i think i'll end here that's it what i was happening in the economy in the last several years thank you thank you dmitry we don't have much time left and if people are listening to us in online or in zoom want to ask questions or want to express their opinion about 2020 you can do this you can raise your hand based on what Dmitry said, I, I think that many people underestimate uh, the postponed uh, internal demand problem. A friend of mine works in a big develop, developing company that is uh, busy const constructing urban complexes, he told me that in uh, good areas, popular areas, only several apartments have been sold. There's a lot of interest, but people are not ready to invest money in long term to buy the good apartment, not a TV set. Obviously, the businesses are not ready to promote this or make it public, but it has an effect on the long term economic uh, picture. Investors are thinking where they should invest into Belarus and if they, because they understand that there is a chance that the demand will be low. These things are not on the surface, but they will affect the economy. My question is my question to the economy. Do we have any raised hands that I can see on the phone? No, I don't see anything either. Great. So uh, if there are no questions, um, uh, Anatoly wanted to add something. I'm sorry about the smoke. Alisa, please turn on the light. We were talking about uh, 2020. I just uh, wanted to say a few words about the prospects. I really liked the presentation of uh, by Dmitry Kruk. He mentioned the word uncertainty more than 10 times. I actually stopped counting as to the next year book 2022. It's uncertainty. Uncertainty is the main word here, just like the uncertainty remains regarding the 2021. 
I know that some people are preparing the HTML version for the EPUB and that from for the EPUB version. I wanted to say that the new, the new yearbook, I uh, want to have it published, despite the instance, despite the fact that Olga Loika, who is one of the authors of the good paper about IT sector, Valeria Kostigova, who was supposed to write about the part, parties, And this is quickly reported today because he wrote the second text for her. A lot was said about that in the yearbook, but since we have what we have, I mentioned some shortcomings. We lack a text about Vitushka or Vitushka about healthcare, which is not great in the COVID year, but he, uh, for safety reasons, decided to not do this. He decided not to do it even on the false name. And uh, I promised him that I would adjust this, his style so that Nobody would he recognize was him. The question of experts. Uh, some of them are abroad, some are in jail, and uh, some of them cannot feel safe, which is important when you write a text. Still, I hope that everyone who took part in this, writing this yearbook will do the same next year. Maybe we'll have to find new authors. This also happens, which is normal, because this year is as interesting as 2020, although even more dark and more surreal, just like the Twin Peaks series. Still, I believe that we'll uh, make the new book not as Maybe as good as this one or even better. That's it from me. Thank you, Anatoly. I uh, can help by join the uh, echo your words. As much as we want to be, remain optimistic, we cannot ignore the challenges of the 2020. And the 2020 was like sitting in an ivory tower. The tower is no longer there. We now have horizontal communication. Only Stella remaining. Despite all that, Anatoly rightly mentioned the challenges that we faced in 2020 that we still will encounter in 2021. But I still believed in Despite everything, the difficult times, during difficult times, we all must do our job. It's always easy to say that I couldn't do it because of the hardships, but it's much more important to hang in there to continue our work so that even in hard times, despite everything, will have uh, our yearly book published. It has been published since 2003, and uh, we want to celebrate the 20th anniversary. Uh, we, uh, I'm sure that all the people that are currently incarcerated will be set free and celebrate this anniversary with us. We're working towards that, and we will do that. We understand all the challenges con connected with the safety and security. Some people cannot write uh, the test because they're afraid to be in jail. Others are already in jail. It's understood. 
it's understandable. We'll find the ways out of this. We'll find people who are ready to cooperate further. Like Gennady Koshnov said, in 2020, give us new people. We will involve them in working on the yearbook. We'll continue our work. We, if any of you have want to say something, please do that. Or if not, I would like would like to thank everyone who took part in today's discussion, those who contributed to the yearbook, who was watching our discussion. Thank you very much, and let's work on.